Yeah, to check out more episodes of the Rap Radar Podcast, what they got to do, B-Dot? It's easy. Sign up at title.com backslash on air for your three-month complimentary membership. Yeah, man, you'll get access to over 48 million songs, tons of videos, exclusive concert live streams, and so much more, man. Yep. What's the address again, B-Dot? Title.com backslash on air. Yeah. Yeah, Rap Radar Podcast, Elliot Wilson. It's B-Dot. This is Knife Wonder. What's going on, bro? Young Guru. Yes, sir. What's up, gentlemen? What's up? What's Legends, you? man. Legends. Give me like a drop for when you hear Guru. Yo, Guru said, how am I gonna, Guru said to me, I'm going to go follow that Jay-Z shit up. I should have been like, nigga, you. Yeah, right? nice. <laughs> we appreciate it, man. Life is beautiful. We're uh, excited, man. Layla's yeah. Wisdom, man. That's the project. You Rhapsody's new album is a project that you guys are very intimately attached to. Yep. Absolutely. So, you guys have been love. telling us how special this record is. I've been telling you how yo, this girl is incredible, man. Yeah, for those that are still maybe a tad doubtful, they haven't listened yet, tell them what's going on with this record. Like, why is this moment so special, do you think, in hip hop right now? I mean, for me, you know, it's not just being a female rapper. The thing about rap is she always wants to challenge herself with any rapper, man or woman. If you see from the, you know, the features that she has, you know, she has Black Thought, she has Kendrick, she has Buster. I mean, if you put them on a list of top rappers of all time, you know, it's yeah. up there. And, she, you know, she always, you know, challenged herself that way. And also subject matter. You know, a lot of people feel as if, you know, women don't have any content. In this day and time, I mean, before we talking about the 90s, of course, you know. But now a lot of people who have fell out of love with hip hop, they say that women don't have content, don't have anything to say other than talking about their bodies or doing this and that and the third. Mm -hmm. No her, extra substance. To right. Her type With thing. her, she wanted content and she wanted to tell a story. And she's a, she's a gifted storyteller when it comes to that. So when you listen to her record, you really have to listen to what she's saying, not only the messages, but the double and triple entendres that she's saying and why she's bringing a message across. So this is your, this is, we credit this is your discovery in a sense, right? No, nah, that's God's discovery, dog. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's this. <laughs> You know, for me, I just saw something that, you know, I thought that was a diamond in the rough. And, and you know, we went from there. You know, I told her the first day I met her, like, listen, if you listen to this rapper, this rapper, this rapper, I hear the raw potential. But if you listen to these people, you know, they really, you know, change the way you look at rhyme and the way you look at schemes and all that type of stuff. And, and she stuck with it. She stayed the course. And she didn't change herself, which was beautiful. Were you sold instantly, Guru, when you first heard the music? Um, yeah, absolutely. The, the rhymes. So, you know, for me, it's special because, um, one, you know, you very rarely in this industry come across people that you have a genuine relationship with. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like meeting ninth for the first time. You know, we just it's, just, it's just like when a Jedi meets a Jedi mm -hmm. and you just click. So besides him being, you know, one of my best friends in the world, it was a thing of watching him grow his 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 naturation over the years of just, you know, staying with what he believed in in a, in a certain sound, disproving people that came to him and said, yo, you'll never go anywhere, just sticking with that sound. Mm -hmm. And then it's like he produces for Jay-Z, produces for Destiny's Child, he produces for Mary J. Blige. You know, not only that, puts together his own conglomerate and, and you know, stays independent for so long. And then, you know, I, I basically asked him the question, like, do you want to sign with anybody at a certain point? And he was like, no, the only person I would ever sign with is your man. Mm. And to see that actually happen, to see it be not just um, the signing of Rhapsody, but the actual signing of a company. Mm. So, you know, for me, it's special because it's like your cousin meeting your cousin. You know what I mean? One side, <laughs> one side is family, the yeah. other side is family. Um, but it was, it, I was so instantly, like sometimes I, I may bug Rhapsody out because she'll spit the verse. And then I hear it, and then I'm calling her like, "Yo, did you hear what you said?" Mm. Da, 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 and I'm like breaking down her verse to her. You know what I mean? But mm. it's just that's how amazing she is as a writer. So it was just, um, it was again, it was just the work put in. It's, it's no nepotism, and it's and it's like it's not an overnight success. And you know, I yeah, put things on. I mean, we yeah. feel like we've all experienced that journey with yeah. you guys with her, right? Yeah. So it's just you know, putting out the right music, putting out the right tapes, doing the right features, and then finally having that time to say, okay, here's going to be the first full length. Yeah. you know, major release. Um, it feels really good to what be What makes Layla's Wisdom different in your mind, Knife? Like, what, what, what made your approach here? What makes this project different than people that may have already loved Rhapsody's mixtapes and feel like those are full projects in a sense? Right. I think the time we, we took to do it. Um, you know, we started Layla's Wisdom May of 2015, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to take that long to craft an album... You know, it really took me out of my box because I think the, the longest record I've ever worked on was uh, either The Listening or The Minstrel Show, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, other than that, you know, all the MERS records that I did, the, the Gene Gray records, the Three Buckshot records. You just knocking those out. <laughs> man, we did. You know, we did Gene Gray and I did Genius in four, four and a half days. Yeah. And I mean, just for this one, it was so many moving parts. We recorded in North Carolina. We recorded in New York. We recorded in um, Los Angeles and D.C. And moving files around and Terrace Martin and playing, playing on records in this city and that city. And, <laughs> you know, it's just it, that just maturation over time you know it took a while like i said two years later so i think that's what made it different and we recorded a lot of records for this album yeah, she too. told me like uh, 80 songs 80 songs something. right and we wanted to make sure that you know it's a totally totally different way of looking at albums and taking a different approach and that's how it came we wanted it to be seamless too we didn't want it to stop we didn't want the music to be dead longer than two seconds yeah if that's the case and you know if we had features we didn't want to have just a feature we wanted the feature to to show up in a different sense, like on Nobody When Black Thought shows up and the beat just totally changes. That's like that beat switching. Yeah, right. yeah that's it. Don't it, get it, to it that. Keeps, yeah, so, you know, it's there's that thing, and we just went, you know, to that. And we were beat switching even before I did yeah. Duckworth for Kendrick. Yeah. Like, yeah. We, we had this beat switching thing going on. So, you know, I we thought it was something different, like, can we talk about Duckworth in that sense? Because, I mean, people know you produced that last song on Kendrick's album. And that, that thing is interesting. Besides the intricate story that Kendrick is telling, the beat mirrors it, right? Like, the way the beat switches and the bass lines come. Like, it mirrors the drama. Like, it starts off kind of light. And as it gets serious, like, the tones change right. up with the storyline, in a sense. I, you know, I gave, I gave Kendrick, like, 20 beats. You know, it was a crazy day in Los Angeles. Because I think at, at 1 o'clock that day, we went to see Snoop. At six o'clock that day, we went to Dre Studio C Dre, and then we saw Kendrick at eleven o'clock. I'm oh, like, wow. I'm like, that's that's the West Coast. That's kind of fantasy, <laughs> yeah, right. that's that's fantasy right. shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I said to rap, I was like, man, anytime an out of towner can come and do that in a day, we've accomplished something, and you know we're at a certain level. So I played twenty beats for him, and he's like, I'm gonna live with these. And then in June of 2016, he sent me a nine second snippet. <laughs> I've been putting his camera at the com um, his camera at the computer, and he played like when the beat switches, and I was like, "What's that?" I texted back, "What's that?" He LOL, and I ain't hear from him again for like six months. <laughs> <laughs> and then these rappers is evil, beat up. Like, <laughs> and so you know, it, you know, is you know, TD Dave is you know who is kind of and shouts to Dave man because yeah. doing this album, I call Dave a lot. I called him a lot, and we talked about strategies and all type of things. So shouts to him. Oh, you for know, raps album, you're yeah, yeah, for raps album. Gave you mm -hmm. some advisement on that. Absolutely, absolutely. Because um, you never can stop learning from anybody. And and for him, he hit me. He was like, "Hey man, I need the samples for these two songs." I'm like thinking, "Oh, I got two beats that made it." Then he hit me back and said, "As a third beat, I need the sample for information for." And I was like, "Oh, I okay, I got three. And then <laughs> then he called me back and was like, "I said, man, let's. I got three joints on there." He like, "Nah." It's one song. Mm. I said, what? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, what's going on? And um, he's like, yeah, man, it's the greatest story Kendrick has ever told. And 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 for him to say that, listening to Kendrick as long as I have, I'm like, there's no way in the world that's yeah. the greatest mm -hmm. story. And then Doc called me the night before South by Southwest. And he called me and said, man, I want you to mix the beat. It's your beat. I want you to mix it. And he sent the session and we mixed it. And it took us a couple of times just to get through it, just to hear and my man Crisis, who has been a long time compadre, yeah. brother, friend of mine, producer in yes, arms, said, man, are you listening to what he's saying? And so we finally listened to what he said. And it was like, yo. And the original name of that song was Life is Like a Box of Chicken. Mm. The chicken incident. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so that's, which is crazy. It's so, a yeah. full circle moment because, you know, that tweet went out, you know, from back in the day. It was like, I want a knife, one to beat. And you finally got one and Fine. you murdered it. It was crazy. I, he, that tweet, he sent that tweet out. August of 2010, and, and I met him at Rock the Bells on that Saturday. Oh, wow. But he tweeted it that Friday night. Wow. And I met all of them at the same time, and 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 not knowing he sent that tweet the night before. Oh, wow. So when did you first grasp the story? You was talking about Top Dog, and like, what, what was it like for you to first hear the narrative? Oh, my God. The first thing I did, I hit him. I said, man, is this story true? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, man, it's true. He said, man, actually, I'm leaving some stuff out, but it's, everything is true about that story. And he said, man, it's the last song on the album. It closes the album together and, you know, brings it to a finale, and 
people gonna be hitting you like crazy when we drop this. Mm. Yeah. And the thing about Dot is, if you if you ever work with him and make an album, you can't say anything until that album drops. Mm. Yeah. And so that also was, they say he's very he's very meticulous himself and oh heavy handed in his music, right? Oh my God! Like he knows exactly what he wants to do. You know what he's trying to get to, and you know the points he's trying to make, and the soundscapes that goes with it. Right. So, we had a night at the studio where obviously Ninth is, you know, he had to work on the record at the studio, mm -hmm. right? Oh, so the duck work. Yeah, yeah, yeah but so, so obviously, yeah. some, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> obviously, some people in our studio, you know, what I'm saying the studio in North Carolina knew about it. Mm. So I'm just building on what you said about nobody's supposed to know. He came out and made the the biggest statement I've ever. He said, "Man, if I hear." or find out of anybody even remotely talking about this, you can never come back to the studio ever <laughs> again in life. <laughs> no tweet, no snap, no, no nothing. nothing. Don't tell your mama, your girl, nobody. Nah. Yeah, it was real. It was real. Classified information. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a lot of classified But But it, it led up. It was secret. It was a big reveal when we all, we didn't hear it until the album came. It yeah, exactly. It's so hard in this climate, right? Because it just takes one person. One, one loud one. Mouth or somebody <laughs> on Snap or putting something up. Or, you know what I mean? Like, it's no, you know, in the age of social media, there's no secrecy anymore. There's no suspense. There's no turn on, yeah. you know? And and it's like for him, he, he really believes in it. And I'm not trying to disrupt that or will never disrupt that. Even when we we did Two Pimple Butterflies, like we had to sit on that for months. Mm. That was the hardest thing ever to do, like just to sit on that and just oh, not tell anybody. Yeah. Complexion, yeah. yeah. Complexion for, rap, for rap, you know what I yeah. mean? Like just talking back and forth and, you know, him telling me like, yo, man, she's the only feature on the album. Crazy. That's big. And I'm Crazy. like, your rap feature, and I'm like... <laughs> and we, gotta, we gotta sit on this and people asking me and now that I you know I teach class I yeah. teach the university both of us do yep. and I know it's hard for him anytime something comes across the wire whether it be a Jay-Z record a rap record or, or you did first Jay-Z turn down the Super Bowl yeah you're, you're, <laughs> your first contact like the, my whole semester kids is asking me like yo so what's up with that Kendrick album you know anything right. about it mm -hmm. when Damn was coming out I'm like nah lying nah I don't know nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't know anything, nah, man, I, nothing. <laughs> and the whole time I'm on it, and I can't see it. So when I when the record came out and I went to class, man, <laughs> they were mad at me, bro. It was mad at we me. We weren't mad when earlier this year, I'm kind of mad at you, actually, because this record is not on the album, on uh, uh, Rhapsody's album, Pain. <laughs> <laughs> what the I hell? Because that record came out and it kind of like shook the internet a little bit. Like We right. weren't expecting that. <laughs> So, like, how did that come about, that whole session? Man, uh, shouts to um, my another producer in the Soul Council and my production label manager. My label manager, Cash. Cash don't make, he calls himself Cash don't make beats. But we were in the L.A. in the studio, and we were just going through records, and we played The Pain. And Cash was like, hey, we got to put that out now. Mm -hmm. And that was a record that was produced by Knotts. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. he was like, man, we got to put that out now, man. You know, Pain is a... Um, Four year old record. Oh wow! And so you know, they just put it out. And so when we did these Jam Rock Fridays, we just started putting out records mm -hmm. that we had been sitting on, mm -hmm. that we had. And Pain was number yeah. one. But we I all had personal records that we were like, okay, what was yours, Goo? Obama like my shit. Mm. It's just, it's just my joint. I was like, we can't waste this record. Like the record was just so good, and it was just, you know, I'm from that, still from that school of we got to warm this up. We got to give, 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 because I'm trying to convert people to Rhapsody. So, mm. it's, you know, as much as we realize that there's a fan base out there, I'm not about preaching to the choir. I want to just expose as many people to her. So I was just like, we got to warm this up before the album come out and let people. And that's one of them ones where she's just spitting. It. And you know, everybody has their personals, but I, right. that one was like, yeah. man, Which one again. Oh, Obama like my shit. Oh, but it's yeah, funny you yeah. say that, Goo, because I remember uh, a while back you tweeted that there's no such thing as a first single anymore. You still nah, believe that? Yeah, it's not. It's not no first singles no more. Like, like we could have a, pl a complete plan of whatever way we want to go, mm. and then when the album drops, people are going to pick whatever record that they like. Like, there is no... There is no first single where you're like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna concentrate on this one record. Mm. I don't, I don't, consume I don't that. Yeah, yeah, I don't believe that anymore, and I don't believe that um, that the way that we used to do that is still valid. Mm. You know, radio is gonna pick up on what they want. And some things may not hit radio. Some things are just organic. Mm. There's people out there that have full careers that have never touched radio. Right. So, but but at the same time. There's a lot of people out there that's like, oh, radio's dead. Radio's not dead, right? <laughs> because you still have this thing where you have millions of people 
that are that are funneled, you know, mm-hmm. through this through this one station. But because of the internet, because of you know podcasts, because of so many other things, um, now people get their music all over. My my children listen to music through YouTube. Mm. Right, my my son is fourteen years old. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. as as much as I, you know, give him a title subscription, like he still <laughs> listens to music because he visually wants to see people. Yeah, right, right, but I said. but I also see the effect of what it's doing is that he's learning about the past music. Mm. If 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 a, if a Tupac movie comes out, he sits and watches all the documentaries on Tupac. Mm-hmm. My son is like the biggest Tupac NWA fan now. Mm, wow. You know, or if Prodigy passes away, my son goes and listens to all the Mob Deep records. Yeah. You know, and to him, it's the same videos. thing as as as, as Bob Marley passing away when I was nine years old and like, okay, now let me go back and listen to all the music. It's the same thing. But that access, I believe, has squashed the way that we used to think about rolling our records. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of, of production, and then you mentioned Knots, how is it for you, Knife, kind of sharing the, sharing the wealth? Like, it's the, this whole album is produced and written and arranged by Knife Wonder. Like, there's a lot of other producers. Like, what's your approach to that in terms of, like, bringing other producers into the fold? Because I know Rap had told me, like, you guys had talked about uh, the Young Gifted and the Black sample and the way mm-hmm. she kind of wanted to chop, she was like, you said Knots could do that and then brought Knots in. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, why was that the right thing for that for a record like that, the intro? I mean, I mean, for for me, just speaking on the production there, like, I just, you know, I'm a purveyor and a study of the culture. And so if I think of organized noise, a Beast by the Pound, a Bomb Squad, or any collective of beat makers, any, the UMA, like, any collection of beat makers or production team, <clears throat> I can't do it by myself, you know, and and I and I truly and understand and believe that. So, I know I'm good at certain things, but I'm not as good at, at the certain things that Knotts is or Crisis or Cash. Like I need something from somebody if I need to get it. I have a production team of people, whether it be E. Jones, whether it be Amp, or whether it be Eric G. who did Sassy and yeah. Rodden. Um, we're all known for a certain thing, but as a collective, we can kind of build towards a brand. And that's that's the kind of idea that I, I I came up with mm. pretty much. And that collective is called the Soul Council. The Soul Council. Mm. Cool. Who was is the council responsible for Black and Ugly? Because I I'm listening. This is one of my, my favorites. Joint. I'm yeah, responsible my for joint. Black and Ugly. Is it? <laughs> Can I say? <laughs> was that I, I song inspired by like Color Purple by any chance? You know, it it might have been. You know, just from the just from the fact that what I sampled, you know, I sampled uh, Shouts to Tweet. I sampled an outro for an album mm. for that. You know, I can say these things now because we cleared all the samples. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, you know, Shouts to Her and, you know, Rap heard it and went with it. But at the same time for Rap, being uh, a woman, being dark skin and short hair, you know, that's kind of like has been a, a taboo thing amongst outside of just American society and the, within black society. Mm-hmm. And there's something she wanted to talk about, really. You know, I remember when they used to call me ugly, you know, yeah. just that type of thing. So, you know, that's that's where she took it. That's why, because I thought about that scene in The Color Purple when uh, Danny Glover's talking to Whoopi. He's like, you're, you're ugly, you're black, you're, you're woman. You're at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but so. dear God, I'm here. Yeah, that's right. Nice. You yeah. shake funny. <laughs> you shake, yeah. You're a woman, you're nothing at all. Yeah, exactly. that. And, uh, you know, that's, you know. That's just her approach. It's, that's just been that's her approach to everything, hard, man. That's like my, that's you know what's crazy, part, man? man? I go around playing the record for, you know, we went around playing the record for the people that we could play it for. Yeah. And, you know, certain records that struck a chord with people. And we went in the studio with Busta Rhymes like yeah. a month ago. And he yeah. ordered us to play the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the order. You don't say right. Busta. <laughs> yeah, order. And, you know, he loved the whole album. But he said, man, black and ugly, man. Oh, my God. But the record he's on too is just, it's killed the way you flip the Goody Mob yeah, record. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did the first part of the beat and um uh we had somebody else come in, Coup de, Coup de Gras. Yeah. They played over it, you know, the little desperado guitar at the beginning. Mm. And then when the beat switches, Buster's on that beat and Eric G did that beat. Mm. Yeah. Speaking so, of yeah. samples that Jesus coming to end it, what's that band to go? Yeah, what's I that, find what's time that? to go. Yeah. As as old as Johnson. Mm. Um yeah, Otis Johnson, yeah. Well, that's that a great, that's from. a great, I mean, speaking it's, of Duckworth, an incredible outro yeah. to Kendrick's album, talk about that Jesus coming and like the yeah. storytelling on that joint. Oh my God, mm-hmm. like that was a record that she wanted to get uh, Amber Naver from the group Moonchild on. That's the lead single of Moonchild. And she put her on it and it just came up with this like haunting way to take the album out, man. Yeah, and it's so like, unconventional. Yo, yeah. oh my God. It's like just, not making it by herself. That's what right. I was interested. Right. right, but speaking in the, you know, the first verse is about a kid overdosing at a party. 
The second verse is about a mom and a daughter out being, you know, being victim of a drive-by. And the third one is about, you know, two soldiers from two different worlds and two different religions fighting to get home to their family. Hmm. Like, this is what I'm saying about it. You can't call it <laughs> a, a, the, a right. female rap. Like, what is that? Like, she, she, it's, it's content. But you guys were sitting on a lot of records from Crown Sessions too, right? So did any of those records make this new album? Ooh, we made uh, Ooh, we was on Ooh, Crown, we yeah. made it, yeah. You know, and the thing about Crown was, you know, we wanted something to heat the album up. So last October, you know, when Rock Nation meets, like, before we put this album out, let's get something to heat it up. Mm. And we did Crown in three. Now, that's something we did in three weeks. Yeah, oh, wow. We wow. did Crown in three yeah. weeks. Yeah. Wow. It sounds like it took a long time nah, to put together. Three weeks, brother. Three weeks. Wow. And with also the great mind you mentioned earlier, Terrace Martin, how did he get involved? And, in, like, what, what's his role, Guru, in, your, in the process? Family. No, I mean, one, he, he elevated the album because... <laughs> You know, the sound that we've been riding with for so long is like, how do you still stay consistent but elevate it? So he's a genius, man. This 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 guy is like yeah. one of those rare people that is really a jazz cat, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 can sit there and play a horn, play keyboards, all these things, studying with Herbie Hancock, with yeah. Quincy Jones, you know, some of the greats of our time, but also completely understands the hip hop side of it too. Mm -hmm. So he's just a gem, but that's that's family, man. Like, you know, that's that's why the, the album is executive produced by all of us because because we felt like, you know, he really brought something to the album to to um, to bring it to another level. But it was also an express. It was fun for me to see it as an expression of him and Knife <clears throat> having conversation mm -hmm. where Knife was like, OK, let's do this. Let's do that. OK, let's keep that part. I want you to play on this. No, here go the top. Blah, 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 and then play that. And then, OK, now stop now. Add the bass line. Blah, blah, blah. And then he would just interpret all the things that Knife was saying. It was just incredible to watch. And then after the all of that. He goes in the booth and starts playing the sax. And you know, it's like you know what I mean? He's an incredible musician, man. And 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 I think people are gonna see that in years to come, you know, especially with his group, the poly seeds. Like it's just it, he's an he's an incredible dude. Man. What are some moments now on the album where you feel like he added a great touches oh, to it what? and really pushed? Um you know, first and foremost, like I got into this thing where if I meet an artist, if it's a modern day artist, that I will sample them and then they play over what I sample from them. You used to love me. I remember when you you that's him. Mm. That a piece that he sent me to sample, and then he ended up playing over that with bass line mm -hmm. and everything. The same thing with um at the beginning of the roller coaster, I sampled a Gwen Bunn song. She came back and sang over what I sampled from her. Damn. So, <laughs> you know, that's kind of like what we, we did on this record. But for him, I wanted it, like I said, to be seamless and turn it into an event and into a a movie, you know, Terrence Martin comes from the tutelage of Dr. Dre, the the great yeah. movie maker. When mm -hmm. it comes to you know experiences, and the Chronic was an experience. Chronic, this last Compton was an experience, right. mm -hmm. and so he comes from that school. You know, you know, just not only comes from that school, but just uh just the vibe of Los mm -hmm. Angeles and their artists, man, right. like. <laughs> it's just the, the way they look at music and the way they feel it is totally different from everybody else. And I needed that. I needed that for him to come in and play everything and play on top of stuff. And like he said, let's pick a sound, let's pick a move. He understands mood, frequency, mm -hmm. how yeah. certain keyboard sounds are going to affect people, everything. Mm -hmm. He gets So it, it just gave you the action push and motivated yes. you even more, And right? that's why he's one. There's four executive producers on this album, myself, Guru, Terrence, and Rhapsody. Mm -hmm. And Goo, did you? I know you produced "Don't Need It," you know, for rap back mm -hmm. in the day. Like, did you have anything for this album in particular? That? Nah, what I was doing was basically, you know, for me, it's about now highlighting everybody. So highlighting the Soul Council, right? Mm -hmm. My 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 job now of of being at Jamila is to push everybody as much as possible. So "Don't Need It" really came about because I sit on a lot of beats. And knife is the is the opposite of, <laughs> is the opposite of me because I'm a perfectionist and I'm like all oh, the snaring right. And knife will just be like here, give me this. And I had to learn that from my brother. Like, goo, just put it out. So don't need it. I was really, I swear to you, I was holding it for Joey Badass. He I was. wanted it. Mm -hmm. I wanted Joey to spit on it so bad. And then he was like, man, if you don't give me that beat, to, <laughs> so he song. yeah he took it. And you know, gave it to, and I was like, nah, rap can have it. And then we got Joey on the remix. Is that her singing too, as well on that? That's no, Myrna. no, no, that's Myrna. Oh, okay. an, an incredible girl from um from Canada. Canada. I mean, that that girl is so talented, man. When the world figures it out, she's gonna be another one. Um, and it's just like you know, we 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 connect with good people, man. And 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 it doesn't take 
you having 80 million thousand, you know, followers or views <laughs> or whatever. If I hear talent, I hear talent. Right. And that girl's super talented. So I had did the record um, and then just gave it the rap and then rap did it. But it was just like, you know, it was another example of what Ninth always showed me about Goose. Stop holding everything. Just mm. give it to the world. Yeah. And Myrna is also who I sampled for You Should Know. I'm a mama roll and stuff. That's mm. her. So she gave me a acapella. I sampled it. <laughs> you like that sample? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, you know, it's, it's one thing to sample, you know, sampling is like history. We have two choices. We can, like, learn from history and sample from the 70s, or we can sample the now. Mm. And so now I'm really into sampling the now. And when did that switch for you? And is that a different challenge? Or do you think people rely too much on you the know, foundations? We, we just times? understand what people's minds are right now. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, we, we have this thing in the studio, the Soul Council has this thing that we do some, from time to time to challenge each, each other called... Uh, 90s flip week mm. where we just take a lot of 90s songs and try to flip them and then we play them for each other mm. so when it came to like Crown you know when we did Crown you know I flipped a song a, a, a few songs on Crown we're gonna not say what it is <laughs> but, <they're not> <laughs> but you know you get, so you know those are the things we've been trying to do so for this album I did the exact same thing with the tweet joint with Myrna with uh, Gwen Bunn with with Terrace flipping that just a lot of stuff that's now mm. And doing it that way. Well, cool. You took something old and brought it new with uh, Sister Nancy yeah, early yeah. this year, man, yeah, man, on the Jay Z four 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 band. Sister Nancy was that was the whole Jamaica trip was incredible, man. Like mm. it was incredible. Just you know the the that rhythm is a, is a classic rhythm in right. reggae. You know what I'm saying? And then to have her actually come to the studio was an amazing thing. And it was just like the whole of of Jamaica was like right there. Everybody mm. that was important in reggae music. And it was just like the way that the Marlies treated us, you know, taking us out. Um, but to actually be at Tough Gong, mm. that was, I've been in Jamaica a mad times, but right. to actually go to <laughs> Tough Gong, that was my first time ever going there. And just you feel that vibe when you when you walk into the studio just and to know the history of, of Bob Marley and the fact that he actually bought Tough Gong mm. and that the family still owns it and what that, that place means to the culture. Um, and, and we had like sort of like an impromptu session in there where I just started playing reggae music, just like really starting at Sky and coming all the way up to right now. And it was just like the vibes in there were, were amazing, man. It was, wow. a, it was a great thing. You got to understand something about Goo. Like when we talk, he travels the world and I travel the world. Like when he, we talk, it's not... When he texts me, it's not like, yo, I went to the club. I went to the club that night. We did it. <laughs> nah, it's not that. Like, he'll send me a picture of a bridge with great architecture. Like, you see this bridge? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And I was in Tough Gong last night. It's just. That's surreal. We nerds. We nerds, bro. The beautiful thing is that um, that Tough Gong label had not been used for so long. And when we. You know, Jay just. The genius that he is, we pressed up 45s. Mm. of Bam and I did a special um, like dub mix you know for people that know yeah. dub music I did a dub mix on the B side and they blessed us enough to give us the the Tuff Gong labels mm. to actually press the 45s with wow. those labels wow. at Tuff Gong so it was amazing man like those type of things are just priceless Walking, even Flex got one <laughs> yeah of course not but it's about the culture man you know what I'm saying it's about the culture you gotta give it to the people that you respect and the people that to me deserve it and you know have represented the culture for so long so it was very hard because it's like okay Jay has this thing with the numbers and he only did 44 of them so like a lot of it I was like okay we gotta take care of traditional sounds mm -hmm. right people that have pushed the, the reggae culture sound and systems. yeah sound systems mm -hmm. and then we also have to take care of a lot of the you know classic hip hop mm -hmm. DJ so it was hard to pick those people cause I got a million people still and I'm like dog he only did 44 <laughs> like, I can't I can't just mass produce these but you know it's just it was another like thing that I think the rollout for that album is just genius and it was another piece that just made it like you know very special for four I mean, we four. obviously spoke to Jay you might yeah. have seen it it was it did pretty good <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> no kidding. kidding really really good interview <laughs> thank, thank you, you, thank now, you. By, by the way I, to me I think that's his best interview ever oh thank you God. no pressure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Goo like what was your experience like what's your perspective of, of creating 444 man because the last couple albums you hadn't worked with Jay so you yeah, reconnected I, on I, this like, one what was that like see for, for me it's like I served a purpose so 
if you if you talk about watch the throne, then it's like okay, that's Kanye, that's Jay. Kanye has his way of working, his whole system of working. So I'm not going to work on that album. Mm -hmm. um, Magna Carta was really led by Timberland, so like right. Timberland has his engineer and his way of working. So I, I really felt like when I was I went to the first couple sessions and I'm just like kind of chilling on the couch. So I was like, mm, I, I can go do something else. You know what I mean? So with this one, it was Jay calling me. Um, as usual, was out the blue. You never know, you know, <laughs> when you're going to get that call. I was actually in LA working with Alicia, um, you know, on on tour with her. And Jay was just like, come to the crib. And, and we really just started. And that was like, I think like January of of last, you know, January of this year, top of the year. Um, top of the year. So it was just like really trying to see, my main thing was like, are you, do you, you sure you want to like, is this where we going? You know what I mean? Because it was so personal. I had never heard him be that person. So right out the gate, he was coming with that. It was just the ideas that he was coming with was incredible. You know, um, just the perspectives of like, like a kill Jay Z to me was incredible of, of having that conversation with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then just all the topics that he touched on and, and where it was in terms of like black empowerment and just empowerment in general. Um, but also the twist that he has that's real good where it's like I'm not telling you not to do these things I'm telling you like there are more important things than this 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 and this yeah. and I'm also speaking from experience because I did those things so in hindsight I could have did this with my money you know that's that's where you get some of those like oh yeah. Dumbo lines and mm -hmm. like things like I bought every V12 engine which I could take it back to the beginning like that's frivolous like okay you want to be hot, you want to buy the new car, the car depreciates. Let's buy some things that that go up in value. Mm. So just all those lessons. Um, then, then from like a hip hop perspective, I don't know if we've seen a 47 year old release. Yes, there's been 47 year olds releasing music, but I mean that that has garnered the attention of this album. Yeah, right. um, and at this point in his career. So it's again, pushing the culture forward to say that it doesn't have to necessarily be just a young man's sport. So, you know, we, we, we get to a point now where we see that we can have some mature um, in these albums U2 still makes albums you know like like hip hop we have to get to a point where we can understand that people that there's no age limit to it it's, it's a mental sport yeah, yeah. And even like he said recording with like the shitty mics and like yeah th those those things were like okay so you know he's doing he had a cold and he was he was just doing the lyrics on an SM57, which is which is like a standard microphone. It's a very cheap microphone. It's something that everybody can afford. But it's also like the microphone that like Marvin Gaye recorded on, or you know people like that. So it gives a certain tone and a certain texture. But then normally I would be like, you know, wait till your cold is gone. Yeah. So you know, but but, but it gave a, it gave such a texture to the yeah, music and added on because of the fact that it's like we're recording with those type of microphones or um, just just the recording, you know, in different places. Those those type of things mm -hmm. really added on. So it was just again, it was it was a um another adventure and it's hard when you're in it to say, okay, well what are you where do you rank this or wh where is this going to be because it's like you're in it, you're trying to make it. So it's you know, it's just my job to make sure that we put out the best product. And I think, you know, I'm I'm super proud of this album and what it means not only for the culture but just for his, historically what right. it's going to mean. Yeah. What's your favorite record still Marcy me? Or is it? That was yours, right? Knife? Okay. Marcy Me is up there. Family Feud. Um, I just love Family Feud. Bam, obviously, for, you know, for, for like, I'm a big reggae head. Mm -hmm. um, so Bam is up there. Um, it's hard for me to pick a favorite, though. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's just different feels at different times. Yeah. You know? and How I many guess, classics does he have, Guru? He's mad at me because I won't give him six. <laughs> no, he no, still no, wants no, no, six. I was, no, no, no. I was, I was only, I was only mad about one specific <laughs> thing that the black album was like nowhere near on your list. <laughs> yeah, you like you had to get talked into the black and I'm like, yo, that should be... Okay, so before before 444, I had a holy trinity. Right. I had Reasonable Doubt, Blueprint, and Black. We're going to get Knife Wonder's opinion on right? Yeah, we should definitely get Knife's opinion, right? And, and, and of course, he's going to go a little bit towards black because he produced on it. Of course. But my holy trinity Trinity was Reasonable Doubt, Blueprint, Black. And then I was saying 444 was a little early mm. for me to even, I don't like when people go classic, like just out the gate for yeah. now. I'm like, yo, it was tw less than 24 <laughs> hours. You haven't even <laughs> absorbed what's on the record. Right, it's right. impossible, you know what I mean, for you to absorb that that fast. So, you know, I, I was arguing to say, is 444 going to be in that top four? And I think it will be. Yeah. But time has to tell that and the people have to tell that. I'm also a person that like, I have my personal opinion, mm -hmm. but then I know I'm in tune with what people like because I DJ. Right. So, you know, I'm I'm in tune really with what like 
it could be outside of my personal taste, but then I know where to rank it because the people rank certain right. things. So, yeah, so yeah. again, you guys touched on this, but I never had American Gangster that high. Mm. And the people pushed American Gangster up yeah. for me. And that was like, okay, like y'all really, like it wasn't like a bad album, but it wasn't in my top discussion. Mm. And people are like, no, you're bugging. I want to hear these songs, these songs, these yeah, songs. Right, so, right. you know, I listen to the people a lot of times too, but that's so really my volume two, which is B. That's the big advocate I mean, for that one. That it keeps pushing. I, I, I agree with the opinion. I think it's the, it's the, it's the off the wall thriller argument where off the wall to me has better records. Thriller has bigger records mm, yeah. and you have to respect both. You have to respect. Those, like a lot of those records to me were bonus tracks and they were already records that were kind of hot and he just threw them on at the end. It didn't feel like that was part of the process of those albums. It was like he- I, I absolutely he love them. volume two. You know what yeah. I mean? But but again, it's looking at it from a historical standpoint of saying to me, in my mind, that's the point where Jay became not only just like a leader in the rap world, but it's like that album pushed him into like pop yeah. mm-hmm. culture. And you can definitely feel the difference. You know, if you're going through it, it's like, oh, snap, now everything that I'm doing like is really affecting culture mm-hmm. and outside of just hip hop culture. So that's what that album meant for me. It was like that turning point of superstardom. Mm-hmm. Not just a star, but like but those superstardom. Those songs still resonate today. You can still play It's Like That, you know, Money Cash Holes, mm-hmm. uh, Jigger My Nigga. <laughs> Going, like going. Reservoir Dogs, I mean, yeah, come on. Me, right. He's not giving me and Goo agree though. We're giving him four. We're not giving him I six. I give him six. We'll give Knife, him four. We gotta get your opinion on this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Reasonable doubt, blueprint, black album. That's my top three still. Yeah. Um, whether I'm on the black album or not. Um my fourth album, favorite album is Hard Knock Life. Mm-hmm. Volume two. Yeah. yeah. And then after that I put four, four, four. Mm-hmm. That's for me. Yeah, that's a good I list. don't know this sixth classic. I don't. I. I, I don't know. No, no. You know would have been would have been a classic album for me um, if it wasn't a double disc. Would have been Blueprint. I'm sorry. Oh, I've man. said sorry a million times. So many songs. Jesus go. Christ! <laughs> I've said sorry a if million been, times. Like if that would have been, would have been just one CD. My man, bad. It would have been. It would have been. Yeah, it would have been. My Good bad. God. If we'd have broke that down to like 12, 14 records, oh, it would have been here's amazing. Another, here's a, another great debate. This amazing. is going to go on till the end of the year. It's The Damn versus 444. What's the better hip hop album of the year? I got to go with 444. I mean, it's, it's my record. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 no, but, but that's a great debate. Yeah, it is, it is a great debate. debate and I love, debate, yeah. I love the debate. But don't, don't, don't take anything loses. away from Damn. Like, don't yeah. take nothing away from it. That record is almost like, like it's immaculate. Yeah. Like, the boy is incredible, man. Yeah. He's incredible. Like, he's one of my favorite MCs of all time and I can say that like strong and I'm not hey, you know not. It's, it's hard for yeah. me yes exactly you just hit it it's hard for me to have the conversation with people because I have to ask them when did you come in mm. right because I was a K-Dot fan Right. So I've been there from like him going to radio stations and me knowing people that worked at those radio stations and getting the tapes and getting the songs and me like certain people had never heard Overly Dedicated. Certain people had never heard um, Section 80. Certain people had never (laughs) heard the Kendrick Lamar EP. But I'm one of those people that was like at the South by in the audience singing Pussy and Patron like Mm -hmm. as they, you know what I'm saying, was doing it. Like so it was, it was, you know, it's different for me, but the, the, he's an incredible MC, man. Him, that whole conglomerate, like, they have everything. Like, I'm a huge Ab Soul fan, you know, yeah. that that thing too. So it's just like, I don't know. I, I, it's very rare that you get an MC of that caliber. We, we're not going to see another yeah. one of him for a very long time. Mm. Like, that guy's really good. And then where, he, where he's going with the music is just like, you can see him moving on purpose and what his purpose is with each single move. So yeah. I just love exactly what he's doing and where he's going, his sonic choices mm. to back up exactly what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, what's your take now? When did you realize Kendrick was one of those all-time special? Talents? Probably around overly dedicated Section 80. I thought that he was, you know, at a time where people thought that not only lyricism was dead in a mainstream sense, but the subject matter of what you talked about was also dead. Mm. You know, that people didn't want to hear that. That's like, that's the biggest barbershop argument. Like, don't nobody want to hear that. Mm -hmm. Well, two million records later, (laughs) you know what I mean? (laughs) You know, he kind of broke the idea of this doesn't sell or concept albums doesn't sell because Good Kid, Mad City was a concept album. Super concept. And for, for, you know, again, I always talk about my students, you know, for them, I mean, when it first released, like, is it this generation's Illmatic? And I believe it is because yeah, the yeah. way it runs, it runs together. And you have to think about the kid who 
is 14, and that's their first rap record. Right. That they really sat and listened yeah, to. Right. Yeah, right. Yes. You got you to gotta put that in perspective. So, you know, does he belong with the greats? Absolutely, man. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. already. Like, that's, that, that's already, not even an yeah. argument. And, 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 I mean, if you think about it hard, you know, if you go Section 80, Good Kid, to Pimp, damn, how many rappers in history can we say did that? Yeah. I actually had this discussion with a friend yesterday, <laughs> this week actually, and I don't and know what, about. What, are, what are those are uh, uh, like. People don't consider Section Eighty an album. Is that it's an album? I do. Yeah, like it's yeah, an album, yeah. but it's, it's like the, the false start almost. Like false start. Well, like for instance, you know, Fifty Cent, of course, get rich, but you know, we think about like the full clip album that he put out. Yeah, you know, like the guess was back. It was like, but the, no disrespect, that wasn't Section Eighty. I know, but. Like like Fifty was burning up the mixtapes, and I think the mixtapes on purpose is what yeah. got Fifty so hot. But those are purposely rhyming over other people's tracks, right? Right, you, you know what I mean. But then he put out the Guess Who's Back joint on the full clip label, and I guess that was like the prelude to what was going to come. But he's saying okay. that was more like mixtapey vibe. It wasn't like a full right, right. Kind of yeah. album. Yeah. time now. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. We talking yeah. about that time with Fifty Cent, like when it was a mixtape. It was actually a mixtape. You got out the street. <laughs> yeah, right. he was the first kind of dude without the DJ. Yeah, but he right. still was rhyming mm-hmm. over other people's beats. Yeah, right. exactly. Terrible. But now exactly. your mixtape now is like an event more so than ever because of social media and yeah. the platforms that it's on. It's just not just I'm just put this out. Yeah. You know, I had, I had a conversation with Earl Sweatshirt once, and in the <laughs> beat out's favorite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sarcasm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Brilliant kid, man. You know, he said to me, he's like, you know, the difference between, you know, your generation knife and mine is, you know, y'all, the first time you heard Wu Tang was 36 Chambers. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah. He said, you didn't hear the Wu Tang demo tape. You didn't hear the Wu Tang this, the Wu Tang that. You didn't hear any of that. Mm-hmm. He said, man, people have been watching my mistakes since I was 15. Mm-hmm. From YouTube the first to everything. Song you first song mm-hmm. you upload, yeah. it's like, mm-hmm. boom. Yeah. You know, discography begins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Discography yeah. begins. Yeah. And that's, that's the true. difference between. And, and also, too, back then, we used to put out physical copies. So it was like if somebody put out something, everybody didn't have uh, Slum Village volume one because it was a cassette tape yeah so it was us that was up on it and then once that physical thing is down. gone yeah. you got to start dubbing and it's not, it's not so easy to just go yeah. on youtube or go on soundcloud or whatever mm-hmm. and listen to this person's yeah. whole history right so it's like even that physical part of having to go get that person's history was different mm-hmm. so it was like now you can just everything you do every mistake you make every rhyme you ever spit everybody can go back and listen to that whole thing but good. Why would it, on the on the wreck with Rhapsody? She said that you said that she should ribbity rap more. Like, she was just in a zone. She was in a zone, and I love that. I love that because it's, it's real. She was, you know, there's a section of the album when people get into it that has to deal with love, right? Mm-hmm. And not just from a woman's perspective, which I love because she she says it from all perspectives. But it was just like a week or two where all the records that she was sending was these lovey dovey <laughs> records, and I was like, knife, yo. I was like, yo, did he she just me. break up with somebody or something? What is going? Yeah, he, he <laughs> Like, man, hey, baby girl, got a rap, man. I said, what you talk about? He said, man, I like the lovey dovey. I'm into it. You know, it's cool, but she got a rap. I said, all right. So I, I said, I hear you. I hear you. So I, I hit her up and I was like, look, man, a goose say you got to start rippity rapping, man. You got to rippity rap. You got the rap. She said, what you mean? Like, you got to spit. Like, you got to get back to spitting because these music soul child yeah, yeah. knock on my door. BJ Chicago kid. Right? We got you know, that. We got yeah, it. We good. We, we good with those. Yeah, we yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, we get back to these you know bars. what I mean? Let's get back to the, you know. And we even had a conversation how long is the love section of the album? Is it right, too long? Right. But it's right on time. You know, it's right on time. But <laughs> she's like, all right. So when she did, um, you know, you should know, young goo yelling, I should rip it, rap more. And she put that yeah. in the joint. Yeah. That was real, yeah. yeah. What do you think back to the state of the game, even the female side of the game? A lot of attention now has been there, right? It seems yeah. like there's a lot of talk of, you know, Nikki being so dominant and now, like, who's going to now really take the flag and run with it? Mm-hmm. Remy stirred it up by dissing her. Cardi B's having her cultural moment. Like, I see, mm-hmm. I see even even you, Knife, like, I see, like, people being, like, you know, almost drawing it out there. It's like, it's just showing that we can have a Cardi B, right? Excelling. And then yeah. Rhapsody, both things are needed. Can you speak on that? Like, this yeah, is the range like, of things? you know, we just, you know, it's, it's just, it was a different time for us coming up in the 90s, man. We had a lot of women who picked up the microphone mm-hmm. and did it. You know what I mean? That was doing it at the same time. Like, 
everybody from Foxy to Kim to Paula Perry, bro. Yeah, like we had Heather, Perry. Heather, mm-hmm. Heather B. Bahamadia, when Black Thought mentions Bahamadia, Bahamadia as a word for right. You like, know what yeah. I mean? Lady of Rage. Like, we can do this all day long. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? But now it's like, it's only it only has to be one. Just who's the queen, who has yeah. the torch for hip hop? So <laughs> one woman who yeah. is doing it for everybody. And, you know, that's the, if you know rap, her biggest thing is sisterhood. Like, that's her biggest thing. And mm-hmm. she's going to, champion any woman that picks up a mic because for her it's different. It's not just picking up a mic and rhyming and having nice bars. She understands as a woman the obstacles that you have to climb. And for any woman that's brave enough to pick up a a microphone to say something, express herself on the microphone, whether you're talking about Bodak Yellow or knock on my door, it doesn't matter because she understands it. And she champions Mm. all women. Mm. And you also said, Guru, last year that it's weird when people come up to you and say that Rhapsody's dope for a female MC. Yeah, I just or... don't like that. She's dope, period. She's right. not, she's not just. Skin. Yeah, it's just, it's just <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, or, or it's like when people say to me, uh, I wouldn't expect you to be so intelligent. Like, come, what? Like, what? what? Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, right. She's just a dope MC because it's like, okay. Again, this we talking about emceeing, so this is a mental sport. So she can talk about things. Of course, she is a woman, mm-hmm. so she's going to talk about things from a woman's perspective, but judge her on the things that we judge emcees on, mm-hmm. the bar structure, the patterns, the flows. Yeah. You know, how did you talk handle these subject matters? Did you tie things together well? Did you And she does all of those things exceptionally well. Mm-hmm. So it's just it's just annoying sometimes when people say little things like that. That's that's what it feels like, you know, but she's an incredible MC just period. Mm-hmm. And she said, I, "I'm in my, I'm in my lane. The lines dotted all around me. I can merge. I can do what you think you can, but you can't do the same as word with words as I." Yeah. Right. Like that's a line, <laughs> that's a line, <laughs> and she and they, you know just the fact that she can, she can merge into a oh I can talk about street talk, but I can also be go to an emotional place that if you as a male makes some people may call, call you soft behind it, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's what she meant. Like she can she can do whatever she can say whatever, and you know as long as she's witty with it. But it's crazy when people come up and ask like you know she she's nice for a woman. Like that's mm-hmm. just so. That's terrible, man. Right. But that's what we are. The male ego. I, I have noticed this in this game with her jumping on tracks with people, man. Like, notice the people that will rap with her. Mm. And notice the people that won't. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're but, saying a certain level of security. Yeah. As a male. They know as yeah. a male, like, the male ego is a very fragile that's thing. Like, not, that's, that's, that's the woman That's the woman stepping on the basketball court with the men and, 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 and like, hooping. yo, like, hooping she with you. Like you know nobody. what I'm saying? If she, if she fire up three threes, your man going to be like, yo, hold on. We got to switch. Yeah. Let me get her. You know what I mean? You're going to be embarrassed. <laughs> like, that's why she, her and Ab Soul got busy on that record 2 a.m. Oh, man. That's oh, one of my favorite. She knows. That's one of they my favorite records she's ever done. Yeah. Damn. Love that record. But you guys have strong opinions, obviously, like especially on Twitter and checking the fans that come for Uh-oh, rap. And what things. They like, say, what they I mean, say. I don't have it in front of me. You might have yeah. to go to the Carfax Elliot check, but <laughs> especially when it comes to like singles and radio, like do you still have those opinions today? Like when it comes to like Nah, that was early on, man. You know, I, I just got to the point where everybody's gonna have something to say. Mm-hmm. The best way to shut them up is through the work. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I don't I used to go Twitter battles or whatever <laughs> with people. I think we all did that because we were all trying to figure Twitter, Twitter out at some point. Right. But, you know, people are going to tro- – trolls are going to do what they say. You know, they're going to do what they do or whatever. But I think we all figured out how to handle trolls. Just don't say anything back. Yeah. And, you know, now it's like I don't get that much trolling anymore because now the work is there. They're right. seeing it everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, she's it's her third record with Kendrick. It's like I might as well shut up now because right. it's, it's kind of out of my hands. But it seems like as if radio still isn't, because I saw not too long ago you were talking to a fan about like the dynamics of radio, and it yeah. feels like that's not necessarily an objective anymore for you guys. Or, I mean, it's like Goose said, radio matters. Right. I don't. What I mean is not an objective. Is we don't go in the studio and say let's make a radio, radio record. record. Mm-hmm. And you know, even when you know Elliot heard the record, he said, "Man, even the records that y'all kind of went outside the box, she doesn't sound forced." She doesn't yeah. sound like sassy oh, y'all tried to do that. It's like mm. a naturalness to right. it. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. I would I would love for radio to pick up on records, but it's not again, it's if you choose it. If mm. you choose to pick up on this record, great. And you know, we play the game. So it's just like but but gone are the days of me sitting there going, I used to say, okay, not for Rhapsody, but for artists in the past, right? Because radio was so important. It was like let me like make a, a yes. Yeah, working like on that, a bleak yeah. album, yeah. we would hold it up. 
saying, where's the one. radio record? We yeah. don't have the one yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we, we're not doing that no more. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At all. You had said something too, Goo. Like you said, I, I didn't understand them. You could probably give me more clarity. Mm-hmm. You said streaming is counting streamers like when the NBA added a three point line. It's needed, but those who played with one like should be remembered. Yeah. I so so that. okay. So that means this. People got to understand when we was counting numbers and you put when you there are certain things that you can quantify, right? Mm-hmm. People used to count how much did you sell, right? Would you do your first week? Right, all of these numbers that we use to quantify things. Right. Now with streaming, people have to understand. Imagine if I got paid for every time that the blueprint played in somebody's car. Mm. You're counting that number now. You understand what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you added a three point line. We were playing in the game before. There, there's an ability for you to score more points now mm-hmm. because we're counting streaming, which I think is necessary. I'm not saying that it's streaming is where we're going. It's very necessary. It's the future of where we're going. And in actuality, when we figure out everything, it's going to be a bigger revenue stream for all the artists. It's going to be an easier way for you to make more money than just off of album sales. But when you're coming in, then comparing your career now to careers of the past, let's remember that these people were shooting without a three-point line. Mm-hmm. That's really my point. Mm-hmm. You understand that what I mean? in the league. Yeah, so they were playing yeah. in that league without that three-point line. So their averages, yeah. their their all their accolades are without this thing that you have. But in some sense, is that a good thing? Because I feel like nowadays, oh, it's, it's almost like you don't measure success by numbers, right? Right, like, right. Because if I love Rhapsody's album and I think it's dope, I really may look at like how many thousand she like I'm not going crazy about the exact consumption number. Right. I'm more so I'm gonna say the album is dope, right? Like I think a lot of fans right. now it's kind of shifted where, you know, 50 Cent era was the epitome of people were following numbers. Right. And, but now it seems like it's more measured about whether or not we subjectively think something is good or not. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, and that was true. the point of what I was saying. Yeah. I was saying that it's necessary, right? Yeah. We're in that era now. And I love, as an engineer, I love solving problems. I love figuring it out. I love and know that I'm in a time that's changing. Every time I've seen it change, I know that it's changing. So yeah. it's like, this is a beautiful thing. If, if we don't have the sales of the physical albums anymore, then we need something for the artist to have a revenue stream. Yeah. So this is creating something where, okay, now everybody can make money off of the streams. But it's also a thing where I see some of the younger artists like kind of comparing themselves to other people. And it's just like, whoa, hold up, fam. Like, remember, <laughs> this guy was shooting without a three-point line. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's just different in terms of in terms of the argument. But I think it's a great thing. I think where we are still has to be figured out. You know, we actively have people in Congress lobbying for certain laws so that, so that people can get more money or have an equal share of money. We just haven't figured it all out yet. Yeah. We're streaming. But we are. We will. Like, this is, this is new, guys. Like, yeah. this is, I'm saying that to the world. Like, guys, this is new. We're just figuring this out. So let us figure it out. I'm not saying not us as a community, us as a collective, a music collective, and say, what's fair? What's fair for the artists? You know, there can't be just one rate. Mm. Because I could be, all of our music, everybody's music is on the same platform. But if I'm on your platform and I get these many streams per week or per year, my value is stronger than the person that didn't get this or that. So my rate should be different Mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. There there, there can't be just this blanket rate because it will undersell for the people that overachieve Mm. and then it it, it will make it unfair. So we just have to figure out what, what that actually is. And then, but you know, again, this is the greatest time. I I have a scholarship in South Africa, right? Um, I didn't want to go there and just, just go and be like, oh, I'm walking through and just, oh, woe is me and people are, you know, okay, actually do something, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I, like, I don't like going somewhere, taking pictures and being like, it feels like an outsider, mm. right? When people come into my neighborhood and want to take pictures, it feels like, oh, look at the monkeys in the cage. Like, it's like a zoo, mm. right? Yeah. So, I wanted to be involved. So needless to say, I started a scholarship in South Africa for, for my lane, for right? School of Audio Engineering. I mm-hmm. pick a kid every year. I pay for them to go to um, so, engineering school out of Longa, which is to me one of the worst areas that's affected by gang violence, mm-hmm. poverty, everything. The one thing you notice by walking around Longa, some people don't have water. Mm-hmm. Everybody got a cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. They don't have an Apple phone. You know what I'm saying? Right. They don't have an iPhone, but they, everybody has a cell phone mm-hmm. and they're consuming music. Yeah. 
So it's like wow. the, the world is opened up now for everyone to consume your music 24 hours a day. Right. So that's the biggest thing. It's like that marketplace now is open for everybody. And that, that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's no longer like you got to stand in line and wait to go get the physical copy or how do I ship these copies over? And that was the real reason that we had to deal with record companies to begin with was yeah. like, I can't press up a million copies and ship them and fly them all over the place. So now the power of that, the power of someone just putting a song up online and literally getting that many streams and having that revenue as a 16, 17, 18 year old kid is super powerful mm -hmm. yeah right. speaking of scholarship education I mean now if you're a full you're a professor now for like over a decade now right yeah. like yeah, how, how did that start and then what is the what is the joy I guess the connection you have from doing it why do you like it like what, what do you get out of the process it started man because you know I live in North Carolina never lived anywhere else and you know a lot of my friends that I went to high school with and college with became teachers and so now I'm the famous friend who make beats that can come out. <laughs> but Vida, he's hard to find. His address is not even Googleable. The studio. I'm like, is this the right place? Like, I was like, how do you have your address like hidden on the internet in 2017? But you can't even find Knife in North right. Carolina. That's on purpose. That's on purpose. <laughs> but, um, you know, I would go speak to a lot of my friends' classes. And the word got to, um, at the time, the chancellor of North Carolina Central University, which is uh, a HBCU school that Little Brother was formed. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, do uh, Dr. James Ammons was um, the chancellor. And he asked me to come teach a class along with a play, play uh, Christopher Martin from Kid and Play. Oh, wow. And we taught the class together. Mm -hmm. Um um, in 2006, and then mm -hmm. I went from there to, to um, Duke, who I teach a class with Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, with um, who is now the chair of the department, African American Studies Department at Duke. Um, but now I teach three classes at Duke. Now I teach um, wow. a class mm -hmm. with him. I teach a class called Hip Hop Cinema. Where we watch like like Wednesday. We watch Dead Presidents. Mm -hmm. um, any movie that has the actors or anybody dealing with hip hop or anyone did that early 90s run of movies, we watch. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I teach a beat making class at Duke as well. So I teach at two universities right now, but I've I've taught a semester at uh, University of Pennsylvania, which is Ivy League. I taught a year at Harvard. Uh, I taught a, uh, a master class for a week at University of Virginia earlier this year. I'm glad yeah. it wasn't, you know, later this year when all the craziness was mm -hmm. going on. But um, yeah, man. Um, and, you know, I'm involved in the Smithsonian. I have an exhibit in the Smithsonian. Um, doing well, what that. do you get out? What's your joy of it? Why do you Man, Why do you just, like it? You know, I think Google understands when you know when I say this. We just have a love for people to understand what we do mm -hmm. and what's the end. You know, you love hip hop, you love music. Yeah. Not to be a know it all. It's not about that, but just you know, just basically understand the genius of what you look listening to, because a lot of people that listen to hip hop think it's just something that is past the time. Mm. These people that do these things, man, I don't care if we talking about Jay Z amigos, man. These people that do this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis to affect world change and affect the culture are scientists with this stuff. Mm -hmm. And 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 there's a genius behind it, and we want people to understand the history of it, that it didn't start just yesterday, and it isn't just something we just do in our free time. Yeah. This is a 44-year-old culture that means a lot that came from African diaspora, you know what I mean, that affects all colors of people, not just us. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and that's why I wanted to get into it. And I love it, man. And you see, like so many it. people, I guess, are so attracted to it, but don't really know the history. I mm -hmm. guess, right? That's, exactly. That's, so right. that's a dangerous exactly. thing. And there a lot of people sit in my class, whether they be an eighteen year old or a forty year old, and I get to talking about stuff. It's like, man, I ain't know nothing as you just said. Wow. That they right. thought we was gonna get in there just talking about LL and yeah. and <laughs> Rakim and oh, this album came out on this date. No, yeah. that's not that's right. not what it is. How was that as a balance in that? Because you're like you're a fucking super producer, celebrity guy, like, and you're also a teacher. Because I live in North Carolina. I mean, you came <laughs> mm -hmm. down. It's very, you know, yeah. we, you know, for people who haven't been in North Carolina, you know, it's not everything is not farmland. You know right. what I mean? Like mm -hmm. we live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, nice little it's city. It's a city, and and has you know, a city vibe. It's a city mm -hmm. vibe, and it's very, you know, but it's very chill. It's not. Yeah. Our city cuts off at night. Mm -hmm. Our city stops at <laughs> nine, ten o'clock. <laughs> it's, unless we got it's a major event going in PNC Arena and stuff like that, like. If it's not a weekend, our city turns off because we're a family city. But what about even in the classroom and to that point? Like, you know, I'm sure there are hip-hop like, fans that, like, beats at the I end. can just oh, imagine yeah. being in school oh, and all yeah, of a sudden Dr. Yeah. Dre comes and yeah. is like, where's your homework? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of crazy for the kids because a lot of the kids, you know, it's hard for them. It's different from growing up in New York. You see 
you know, even the early 90s, you, oh, there's Grand Poobah. Oh. You may see a star. Yeah, yeah you right. may see for a lot of kids, you know, coming up in, in the collegiate ranks, our stars are, aren't are stars yet, but they are going to be stars, and that's basketball players. Mm -hmm. Like, I, 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 I teach at North Carolina Central. Duke's right here. The University of North Carolina's right here. So mm -hmm. that's that's half the NBA draft. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that, that kids are right. hanging out on your campus. Right. And, you know, if you went to school in that time, you're like, oh, I remember when Stackhouse used to hang out. I remember when Wallace used to hang out. I remember when Carter used to hang out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's a thing where, you know, basketball is the celebrity in our state mm -hmm. as opposed to entertainers. So people can't hardly kind of fathom and understand it. Yes, your professor has been on 20 million albums. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of hard to yeah. kind of grasp. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you said a lot of people assume that you don't even fully live in North Carolina. Yeah, that's but another thing moved, too, right? which is, you know, even the people that live there, you know, they think that great things can't live and stay there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That it, I'm, If you're supposed to be famous, I'm not supposed to be able to touch you. You know what I mean? New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, they all have these places where they're the, the rich and the famous or the whatever the famous people are able to separate themselves from, you know, Hollywood got the hills, mm -hmm. uh, NY has the Hamptons. Like, we can you can do mm -hmm. this all day. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. We live amongst. You'll see, <laughs> you'll see me in Walmart. You'll see me at Harris Teeter and be like, yeah. What you doing here? Right. I'm like, I, I got a shot, bro. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so we really don't have that separation at home. And, and I kind of like it that way, too. You also get something out of it, like, to address what you're saying, B-Dot. Like, for me, I love teaching, right? And mm -hmm. I love I love to see that light go off in the student's mind. But my kids or my students give me just as much as I give them. Mm -hmm. Both myself and Ninth, this is the thing that we talk about all the time, is that it allows us to stay in tune with the mind of an 18-year-old, right. a 19-year-old. So sometimes you get these reports that people tell you certain things, but when you really sit with the kids, it's mm -hmm. the exact opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And you and it allows you to just be in tune with what they like or what they don't like, or some people will be, all the kids like this type of, you know they don't. They like a whole, I, I, I have arguments like crazy in mm -hmm. my classrooms. And then also, you you know, at USC, it, it was the first time where I got to really build with an 18-year-old white kid. Mm -hmm. you, you understand? Like, I've, I've never yeah. been in that situation. So I know my friends' kids that are going to Howard now and following in our footsteps at HBCUs. But then it's like, there's a whole other avenue of things and, and how our music affects people outside of Absolutely. our culture. So, you know, it really keeps us in tune and in touch. And, and it also develops you as a person because as a teacher, you can know your information inside out. Mm -hmm. But standing up in front of, we joke about this sometimes because people think just because they know it that they can teach it. And that's not mm -hmm. always the case. Like we are literally writing a syllabus. We are creating a curriculum. I have to sit down and figure out how much points each class is for. Ain't no Serato you know, for professors. Guys. Yeah. And, <laughs> Ain't no Serato for And the, the, the worst part about it, or the best part <laughs> about it is, is that every single student has a different learning style. Mm -hmm. So you as a professor has to learn that way of teaching that learning style. Mm. So, like I said, you could know your information backwards yeah. and forwards, but yeah. you have to figure out how to transfer that information to the student, which then opens your mind to understanding why different people like different things. Mm. Yeah. So, it's, it, you know, you can sometimes be in your bubble or you can grow with just your... I, I'm 43 years old, so I have friends that will never be in the hot spot again with kids. They mm. just are with their friends and they have no idea. Yeah. So when they create music, it's for 43-year-olds. Whereas it's like, I can tell where everybody's at and, and how fast things change mm. because of my students. So, you know, it, again, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a, a great thing for me and the way that it works. I'm, a, I'm an artist in resident at right. USC. So, you know, I can then go on a Jay-Z tour, you know what I mean? And, and then come back and still do what I do. But the biggest thing was, was helping the curriculum and bringing it up to a nowadays thing where, at USC, um, the jazz department and the classical department are well-defined. So they brought me in to say, okay, Gu, how do we update our modern, right? What are the programs that the kids should be using? Now that the kids are not going to sell a whole bunch of albums straight out the gate, we have a whole uh, program that's about live performing and everyone understanding that this is going to be your bread and butter. So you better know how to do a live performance mm -hmm. and, and what is a back line yeah. and how do you deal with a manager and how do you set up in a small... Uh, you know, bar all the way to the big arena. Um, you know, all of those things. We yeah. we we brought on so many people to help and and shape the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's the biggest thing of, of of bringing it up to date and saying, okay, this.
this is how you're going to survive and we're preparing you for a music business you know, mm. post album selling. Yeah. Speaking of live, Goo, you back on that road with Hove too on the other yeah, side, man. man. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. You know? <laughs> the, the metals was crazy. The metals was fun, man. Why I think you cut I think we, vocals, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It, was, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a great vibe. Um, the what's thing, your, what's, I mean, you've been with Jay so many times. Like, mm-hmm. what do you think is going to be special? Not to give too much away, but what do you think about this four? It's four, a new four, material. Four, new material. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously four 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 album, and it's new material. We even add in with the old material. It's always a challenge for us because if if I was to please every Jay Z fan, the show would be five hours long. Something yeah. wrong with that. So you know what I'm saying? It's like it's like no yeah. matter what we do, we get off stage, and I got my reasonable doubt people. That's like, oh, I didn't hear dead presidents. I didn't <laughs> yeah. hear this or that. And you know, I'm just, but it's got to make you feel good when people revel about this the sequencing. Like yes, how the, yeah, high at least to I this love, song. It, yes. They're amazed at how you're able to like sequence this so well. The certain songs are complimenting. That's what we yeah. Yeah. not mine at the B, B side. Oh, the B yeah. side. Oh, was me crazy. and him would go. <laughs> we up in the balcony, man, and he when he did. Imaginary player, man. Oh yeah, yeah that was great. He lost it. Yeah. We lost it. Jay, Jay's still. great. His mind is great at sequencing. <laughs> yeah, sequencing that show was was incredible. His mind is great at, at, at going from one thing to another. You have a whole catalog where you can sort of string together all the songs that are nigga songs. You know what I'm saying? That right. say the word nigga <laughs> to say okay, the OJ song. You know what I'm saying? We're saying I'm not saying yeah. it as a negative word. I'm right. saying we obviously well, are going from these songs well, and family these songs feud and the higher to you right. Don't know how exactly high yeah. or just the the ability to say okay, I'm gonna do the sample before we get into. Family. Family Feud, mm-hmm. so that we can, you know, meet, set it up. Like, the, I, I think that was the main thing from from the response. People were like, "I love the transitions, Goo," and I was and like, "Doing like the air yeah. horn, the air." Yeah, the absolutely. Horn, Even yeah. at the Made in America show, when you guys went to the other stage, yeah, how was, did that come about? That's, oh that was gave us a little B sides of. Yeah, we but, love that. Oh, knife actually, t- I saw knife. Knife was like, "Yeah, I think they're doing some type of B sides thing." And I, <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't know what he was talking about. I was like, "Oh, knife, don't know what he's talking about." I'm he thinking, saw like, us, yeah, yeah. he saw us go in the cart. So actually, at um, Made America, yeah. So I've never at Made America. I've never done that before where like I leave as soon as Jay walks off the stage but I had to run with him to go get in that cart so that we could go around to the all the stage. people to the next stage and it was just dope you know what I mean we went from the big stage to okay he goes invite Just so that it could you know it was just a two DJ thing yeah. I think it was really dope that me came out and you know it was like it was like when Prince used to do a whole bunch of shows and then he would leave the show and then go to a club and do play secret, after, right. do yeah, a yeah, secret yeah. show and play yeah, afterwards, it's yeah. the same thing. It's like, okay, let's go do all the B-sides, B-sides yeah. you know, on yeah. a different stage. Like after party and kind of thing. it was also these people that had great seats or were there standing there at the main stage all day. Now these people that were over here get to get, you know, yeah. front row mm. seats. Or so it's just like, it was just, it's, it's made, it was our festival. So right. we could do it. <laughs> Do whatever we want. But that was a say, great you, feeling. I say because of like the response from Jay's B sides, I say that he has like the best solo discography in hip hop. Is that fair to say? It's Would definitely fair to say. It's definitely fair to say. Who has a better discography than Jay? Nobody. Solo. Like I think Outcast has the best group as a as a duo. That's arguable. That's arguable. But I would say Jay has the best solo. Because just the response from like the B sides, people want those more than the hits. Well, it's just that the people don't get to see those all the time. So you have to understand yeah. something too that we have a wide range of fans. So, you know, you definitely... It's, it, okay, let me, give, let me give you another example. You go to Essence and you go see... Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Let's just a pick a group. Act, just, just, just yeah. A classic act, right? Mm-hmm. Or let's say, let's say um, you go see let's say Mary uh, J. Blige or Mary yeah. J. Blige, and you don't hear those songs mm-hmm. that were the songs of your of your life. Mm-hmm. Or if at the end, we all know before I let go, or uh, something like that is going to be the closing for Frankie Beverly and Maze. But if right. I go see Frankie Beverly and yeah. Maze, and I don't hear they those songs, <laughs> they better end. With, right. They better end with these classics. Like I, th- this is what I grew up on. This is what I came to see so there are certain songs that we have to do Mm. right then we're in an album cycle so there's certain songs from the album that we have to do so it's like that's what i mean that's the fun of weaving all those things together and it's you know it's completely jay's discuss jay's mind of Mm. of what he wants to do and then we go out and try to execute that to the best of our ability also the challenge of that the tempos are a little mid-tempo a lot of the songs are 444 like they want to records to be live records yeah but we can add things we could you know we do we do well at like flipping you know things in and out 
adding songs. Second I mean, adding, OJ yeah. acapella. Uh, yeah, okay. so that you can really get it. Um, you know, playing, like I said, playing the original samples. There's a lot of things that we can do to make it creative and fresh, and I think he continues to do that, um, especially for people like like you guys who have mm. seen a lot of so shows, times, like yeah. a lot of Jay-Z shows. So to, to get that response to be like, man, another one, where it's just like he just keeps moving and keeps growing, and that's 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 really what the show is Even the stage looks stripped down, just like you, the as DJ and like two other band yeah, members. Yeah, he, he, he was like, man, we just, we just, this is the look. This is the look we're going to go right. for. And he's very conscious of those looks. So at the same time that, you know, I'm concerned about music and how it sounds and all these other things, that's the genius of him. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you see it in so many documentaries where he's looking at lights. You know, when we opened up the, um, the thing in Brooklyn, you can see that in a documentary oh, right, right. where he's yeah. like, no, flip that, flip that, hold that longer. Yeah. Dude, he's, he's explaining how he wants things to be. And that's, we'll be rapping, that's doing job. the sound check. Well, because, <laughs> because, of the, because of those facts. So it's like, right. I'm doing that so that we, we, do, we record things and we have sound checks and everybody has to be on a professional level. So if Jay's over concerned, you know, if he He's concerned about this thing and he's over here doing this I can be filling in spots so it's all just to support him it's all to make his job easier that's that's for me that's how I look at it is like soldiering for him so that it makes it easier for him so that he could just walk in a half hour before the show yeah let's big up Omar he never really gets yeah, yeah no no Omar's, Omar's a genius man. Omar's <laughs> a genius like he's, yeah. he's again Jay's had a pretty steady band for a while now yes Omar is a, is, a, is an integral part of what we do I, I don't believe that you could find another him the same way we were talking about Terrace before is like Omar is one of those guys that could literally write charts. You know, mm -hmm. for people that don't know, like take a musical piece of paper with, with lines mm -hmm. on it and write the notes out and hand that out to an orchestra and conduct the orchestra, but also understands when you say, hey, I need the Jay Dilla flow groove on this beat. Play it this way, or can you know? He just his his musical knowledge is incredible. You know, and, and guys like that are very very hard to find. Yeah, yeah. so. Well, we got well, Rock Nation. You said mentioned earlier, like you wasn't going to sign. You're adamant about staying independent. What is Rock Nation? We see so many artists of Rock Nation. What's what's it been like for you, and why was that the right move for you and your brand? I mean, it's it's, it's been great for us, man. You know, anybody that knows me, that you know, I want to become popular, or, or artist of mine to become popular, but I don't want to make pop music. There's mm. a difference, and I think that um, you know. Jay and Tata and Emery and everybody and Lenny and everybody understood that about me. They knew that about me from Threat, you know, mm -hmm. and they watched my career over the years that, you know, to have you can have a great brand, but at the same time, you don't have to compromise yourself mm -hmm. on who you are. I think that's one of the big biggest misconceptions about this game, that you have to change. The higher you go, you got to change who you are and the way your music sounds. And anybody that knows me, I haven't. I've grown yeah. um, in a way. You know, but at the same but time, when they hear Duckworth, they hear they Let know it's wisdom, me. They know right. it's still, yeah, they know yeah. it's still me. They they the got me from the listening. <laughs> right, exactly. So I mean, that was the thing for me, and I remember the first couple of days I was being up in there, man. I think the thing that rang with me, you know, just just heavy it was in Tata's office, and and he said, you know, thank you for joining, coming over here. Mm. You know, thank y'all for choosing us. That says a lot. And I'm looking at him mm. like. But you're Rock Nation. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, nah, thank y'all for choosing us. Thank y'all for choosing us and trusting us, to, you know, with your vision. Yeah. And I was like, man, you know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's really a family-oriented place. It's not, you know, just a build on a bunch of cold people, man. Yeah. You know, family is family. The you in or you out. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one thing I've learned being around Jay, being around Goo, being around everybody over there, Shaka, everybody. Yeah. Either you in this family or you're not in this family. And yeah. we draw the line. Mm. Or so what's what's next for Jamla? Is we going to hear with the Layla's man, Wisdom? What's, man. What's, what should we look out for? A few things, man. You know, I have an R and B artist, Hella Victoria. That's Bro. on pay up. That's yeah, yeah. on pay up. HV. Um, um GQ, who's on the end of uh riding. He's from uh, Oakland, California. We're coming with his project. We got a cute uh, couple of new signees. We can't say who yet. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, his verse but, is really good too. Yeah, man, he's he's from man. Yeah, yeah. From you know, Q was one of those. You know, Q was on. He played basketball for University of North Carolina, mm. so he was on the 2005 championship team oh, wow. on that team. So he's one of those that 
you know, one of these all these ball players trying to rap now, he actually can rhyme. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, he's he he believes in the microphone. So and that, the Soul Council, man, you're gonna see council, a lot of beats man. from the Soul. I think now that this album's out and, and people know who these people are, it's the job of ours to like push these these guys. So <clears throat> that's Wait, another who's, way. Who's everybody in the Soul Council? Knots, myself, Eric G. Um, Eric G. The Sassy, right? Eric G. The yes. Sassy. Yep. Mm-hmm. Everybody asks who the white boy in the Soul Council. <laughs> uh, 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 e Jones, Amp, Crisis, and Cash. Mm. That's us. And um, you know, we believe in our sound and, and putting it together, man. And and I think the biggest thing, one of the biggest things out of all of this is, you know, Goo and I have been friends since two thousand and three. Mm. Right, the first day, one of the first weekends, like we were hanging out, man. I saw his twins on the couch, and he was like propping them up because they were so young. Now how old are they? <laughs> 14, 14. <laughs> you know, but, you know, we decided to, you know, start a management company. Game theory, right? Yeah. What's game going theory. on? The game you guys theory. guys want to manage me? What we doing? <laughs> <laughs> it you was know, a natural progression, man, of, of us yeah. doing, we were already doing these things. So it was just like, okay, we need to put this together, not only just for our artists, but for outside people too, because we, we've been just naturally doing these things and putting them together. But I was like... One of the biggest things that I, w- I was saying in Ninth is the learning experience of no matter even if it's family, you need to formalize things mm-hmm. and you need to write things down on paper. Yeah. And it's not a game anymore. It's not a joke. And we are like clearing samples and going through this whole yeah. process and showing independent people the whole mm-hmm. process. So when people say things to me, sometimes we're like, well, Jay will win. And people be like, oh, well, it's Jay. And I'm like, no, it's not magic. It's not magic. People exactly. actually sit down and work. It's a lot and, of behind yeah, the scenes. It's a lot of behind the scenes work. So it's, it's it's really just that. It's us showing people how to do everything correctly. And that's and that's really, and then having that mind state of of trying to do it right. So it's like, no, we're not trying to jerk any artists and take money and do all of that stuff. We want you to win. We want you to get a lion's share of the money. We want to protect you. We want to make sure that everything is right. You may not know about this, 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 and this. So let us show you that. So that's really where it came from. It was just it was just a um a thing that we were already doing, but we needed to formalize right. it. So you guys officially manage Rhapsody? Yes. Yeah. Game Theory? Mm-hmm. And, yes. and Heather Victoria and yes. Q as well. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, shout out to everybody at Rock Nation, man. Everyone, from Jay to everybody, Pat, Wendy, everybody. Yeah. You know, the same as Def Jam. You know, Def Jam's our, you know, market distributor. So yep. they have really been in our corner in a lot of things we've been doing. You know, that's a historical, historical label. Right. We know the history of the culture. And my Jamla staff, you know, Jamla's ran by four people. Myself, Guru, Cash, and uh, Tia, who is Tia's our um, production manager manager and product manager. And she's been my best friend since we've been 13 years old. Right. So, you know, we do it all ourselves, you know, on that, the Jamla side. But as far mm-hmm. as everybody else with Rock Nation and Def Jam, they have been very, very, very helpful and instrumental and patient with us, we're putting out this record. Says, so it's 2015, like, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? So what's up next for you, Google More Car Commercials? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So right. I'm on I'm YouTube. Lot, so this thing is on the fucking and Infinity. Infinity. Yeah. Right. What the fuck is going on? It's an ad. And the AT&T <laughs> joint. Yeah. I'm like, yo, this guy's on engineering. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. 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 He was like, nah, I'm just going to be a photographer. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm just going to be a DJ. Yeah. I mean, yeah. now you know, I'm a great engineer. My photography is real. That's a... The book coming. Uh, eventually, so, okay. eventually, I'm not. <laughs> it's something. Question. It's something that I don't, don't. I don't want to pimp. So I'm never going to do it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I respect the art of photography. I, I am someone who is studying. I'm going to get better. Um, but there's so much respect there for the art that I don't want to just put a book out and people buy my book because they like my mixes. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. I don't want yeah. that. I want them to love my photography. And I'm. I, I feel like. When Ye was like, "Don't call me a producer rapper, right? <laughs> right I'm gonna yeah. be charting with these niggas. Right. Like, I'm I'm gonna be yeah. one of the best photographers you in told the world." Me he did a recent panel with like yeah, some, some of the some of the like some of the Ernie biggest yeah, like it's just, just like gods in the game and people that capture what our culture really look like. Mm. Um, but also on, on my marketing side, you know, I'm, I'm over at TMA, which is the marketing arm. Um, we have a lot of you know big clients. I won't say all the names, you know, but that's that's definitely something that I'm doing. Um, and it's other revenue streams for a lot of our people. In, right. in, in terms I think. That you're showing that because, like I said, when I saw the, saw the car commercial, that was unexpected. Yeah, and like yeah. you're really driving it. That's like a yeah, real commercial. Really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, nah, it's I like speed that. racing. I told you he'll text me with some wild. Yo, man, I had to drive around the curve. They had me doing like sixty in the car. Like it's, it was, it was super yeah. fun to do, man. The hard part is like the director was like, okay. Go ahead, get it out your system. So we was on a track, and he let me go because he knew I wanted to just like 
go as fast yeah, as right. I could around this whole track. He's like, all right, now we have to film this, right? <laughs> so you literally have to drive and you have to be driving like with the hands in the proper positions. But he's like, okay, now sharp right. And then it's like all because camera movements and, and right, the weight. Right. And there's yeah. a there's a car right next to you with a camera mounted to it. Mm. And you can't hit this car. And you got to hit your mark. And you got to drive the way that they want you to drive and nod your head to the music like you're not really yeah. yet. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity. Not only did I do, you know, be in the commercial, but I got a chance to make the music. And then later, that's, you know, you'll, you'll see the group that I've put together because I have a group now called Coup de Gras. Um, that's just going to be a whole other, you know, aspect of myself and just a whole other lane of things that you, you wouldn't expect from me. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just good. That's what's up, man. Yeah. This guy's always give you a lot going on, man. I know. Did you give you a car for that? Like, a check in the I car? I thought they gave him a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Right the, 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 the bag was right. Let's just put it like that. <laughs> the bag was right. Word up. It was right to follow up with you guys, man. Absolutely. Ninth one, the young guru. Thank you guys, man. Two of the great minds. Make Layla's sure they get wisdom. that Layla's wisdom. Yeah, yeah. go pick that album up. Stream it on title now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> and everywhere else, man. Yep. All right, B-Dot. Yes, sir. We yeah. out of here. Rap Radar Podcast. Yep. Yeah.